What's up, everybody, and welcome to New Surge Live. This is the YouTube slash radio version, facebook.com slash 1640pwpr, and also on New Surge Live, as well as throughout, you know, YouTube and everywhere else. Got a big, big show here for you today. Casey Carlisle, we uh, have the interview with her in the can, and it will be coming up here later in this video. But first, I want to talk about a couple things, specifically in the gaming world. Now, there's a video game out there right now, I believe it's called Hatred. And a lot of people are wondering, you know, why this video is making such a big splash here. Let me see here, there's like a, th a dozen YouTube videos talking about this game, receiving an adults-only rating. Um... I believe Steam or uh, Twitch has even post or has even banned the game from being put on their uh, streaming service. You cannot stream this game whatsoever at all. Um, heard from people that the controls in the game are a little wacky, as it's supposed to be a two-stick shooter, uh, meaning you move up, down, left, right, and then your view with the other one, or move the uh, the crosshairs around with the other one. But the basic thing of this game is. You play a guy who just decides to load up with guns and go out and kill people and do mass genocide. Now, a lot of people are sitting there saying, well, that's awful. And <laughs> that's part of the reason ever since this game was out or, or announced, apparently this game has had it in for itself uh, as far as the critics go. Um, I, I, I... I'm torn about this in a couple ways. One, I don't agree with the adult adults only rating because I've seen let's plays of it and playthroughs of it. It's nowhere near as bad as Grand Theft Auto V. <clears throat> On the other hand, Twitch needs to control the whole adult only thing because very few games by um, by the ESRB are rated adult only. So therefore, you know, there, there's not that many of them out there. So you really hadn't had to worry about it up until this game came out and got such a big splash in the gaming world and in the media. Let me tell you, I think this game is like puppies and kittens compared to Grand Theft Auto V. When Grand Theft Auto V came out, I got it on launch day, and I walked into the GameStop. And as I'm sitting there, you know, looking around the store, because I, I can't go into GameStop without looking at the, at the you know, walls first and see what's on the wall. There was... Eight-year-old after six-year-old after, you know, kid after kid after kid, under 18, under 17, hell, under 16 for that matter, walking up with their parents who were totally clueless, going, hi, I like Grand Theft Auto V. The people behind GameStop, they can only do so much. A, their job is to sell games. B, they have to do what the law says and what the ERSRB says, which means to card everybody buying the game. Now, granted, the 15-year-old isn't the one actually paying for the game. 15-year-old Johnny's dad is the one paying for the game, or 8-year-old Johnny's dad is paying for the video game. The cashier proceeds to look at little Johnny's dad and go, You do realize, sir, that Grand Theft Auto V is rated M for Mature. That's all they have to say. That's all they have to say, guys. I'm not saying it should be any more than that, but I do believe that it's up to the parents at this point to make a decision. Hmm. M for mature. Five-year-old little Johnny, are you sure you want, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't be, you know, letting you play this. Uh, uh, maybe we should go get Hello Kitty Island Adventure instead. No, Daddy, I really want the Grand Theft Auto V. I want the Grand Theft Auto V. I want the Grand Theft Auto V. Okay, fine. Here. Now let's go to the liquor store. You have to sit in the car. It's bad parenting. Now, Steam is a totally different story because to get it on Steam, you have to have a credit card. And if you give your six-year-old a credit card or even access to your credit card or even tell your six-year-old where your credit card is, you're fucking stupid as a parent. Sorry. Even if he steals it out of your wallet, you're fucking stupid as a parent. I'm sorry. Now, if I were, I, I this is why I could never work at GameStop because I would sit there and look at Johnny's mother and go, do you realize that there's drug use? gun use, excessive blood, excessive gore, excessive cursing, sex, dry, you, know, you name it, this video game has it. Not to mention the stuff that you can do online that's not rated and cannot be controlled by the ESRB. 
I'd be fired because GameStop looks at, would look at me and go, dude, what are you doing? You're hampering our sales. It's not our fault that people are stupid. Why should you educate them? It's not GameStop's job to educate you. It's GameStop's job, and it's every other video, every other uh, video game company or video game seller's job to sell you games. They don't care if you're educated on this stuff, guys. It's just so happened that, I mean, you know, I had to have my son stop watching wrestling for a little while because he was going to school hitting kids. <laughs> I had to be a parent. I regulated it. I said, son, you can't watch wrestling for a little while. Why? Because you're going to school hitting kids. Next thing you know, you're going to tell people that you're performing wrestling moves. And I can't have that. Not as a guy who does a podcast primarily about pro wrestling. I'm a pro wrestling put quotes around it because it's fucking full of shit. Journalist. I can't be going out there having a kid stunning people or RKOing people or punching people. Now, granted, he has ADD and ODD, but that don't really, fa you know, that may factor into it some. And I'm not using that card as a cop out, folks. I'm just saying I had to do what I had to do as a parent. And he's not allowed to watch WWE as much anymore. Today, that video I posted about him going to Japan or wanting to go to Japan because he saw the Kevin Owens versus Finn, pa Kevin Owens versus Finn Balor. God, I can't talk tonight. Um, he saw that graphic. He was watching that episode of NXT. That's the first bit of wrestling he's watched in about three months. At least three months. He doesn't watch Raw. He doesn't watch SmackDown. At all. He, he rarely watches NXT. If I happen to have it on and he comes through the room and goes, Daddy, can I watch this with you? Melts my heart. I love to see my son. You know, I love to share this business with my boy. I even had to break down and tell my son, wrestling's fake. The F word, I know. Yes, I had to tell him it's a work. I had to tell him that they're pretending. I even had to tell him, look, son, he stomps when he punches. That's where the sound comes from. Now, granted, that's like telling somebody, maybe it's like telling somebody that there is no fat man in a red suit <laughs> that comes around every December. But... It's parenting. I had to do. Sometimes you have to do those to make those harsh decisions. As a decisions, I can't talk. It's nine. It's ten o'clock when I'm recording this, folks. The Casey Carlisle interview is much better. Trust me. Um, because I recorded that earlier in the day. I recorded that at about six hours ago. But uh, anyway, it's just good parenting. You got to practice good parenting. So hatreds out there. It's not that good of a game from what I've been told. I mean, you go around killing homeless people and that gives you health. So what does that tell you? It's nowhere near as gory and messed up as Grand Theft Auto V is, but it's just below the par. Um, and Twitch saying you can't stream it no more because of the AO rating. Sorry, but in my opinion, Grand Theft Auto V should have gotten an AO rating. Granted, if it was gotten an AO rating, you wouldn't have anybody selling it but Steam. Because you can't market a, can a console game that's AO anymore. You can't do that. Just like you don't see NC-17 in the movie theaters anymore. You know, the, the, the... I had my man card taken away on Valentine's Day and got dragged to see Fifty Shades of Grey. And because I knew I was going to get dragged to see it, I went ahead and read the book just to make sure that, you know, just to see how bad they were going to fuck it up on the big screen. And they did. They, they did. It was cheesy and corny and probably could have done a lot more with it. To, and it probably would have been NC-17. The difference between that is, is that people knew what they were getting into ahead of time when they went to see this movie. So if it would have been NC-17... I don't think the box office from it would have been hurt at all. Video games and wrestling are entirely different. Sorry, especially wrestling because they market it towards kids. You know? And granted, wrestling came out 20 years ago. McMahon came out at least, what was it, 1997, 98, and let the cat out of the way. Hell, maybe way before that even. And came out and told you it was a work. They told you. that They're sitting there telling you, don't try this at home. We're basically paid actors and stuntmen who are here to entertain you. There is a bit of a... I mean, I'm sorry. I love wrestling. Wrestling is a bit of my mistress. I've been following it since I'm six years old. 
the day I found out that it was a work, I can't remember when that point in time was, but it was like, eh, okay, but I'm still going to watch it, you know? My son knows it's fake. He still watches it. I had to tell him, so don't go to school punching these kids. I've told him, if you want to go hit somebody, I'll put you in football camp, or I'll put you in a real wrestling camp, or I will, you know, <laughs> fuck, if you want to learn how to work, I'll go down to the local wrestling school and have them show you what it's all about. <laughs> Granted, they're not going to train a five-year-old, but you catch my drift. Um, I, I'd rather you learn to hit somebody the right way, and I guess that's why people put their kids in karate and everything, so that they learn... Karate and everything teaches you a discipline. You learn it so that you don't have to use it, you know, or if you have to use it in an extreme circumstance, you know how to do it without killing somebody, pretty much. Um, but anyway, my rant's over. I'm getting off my soapbox here. A couple other things that I wanted to talk about here. WWE is holding their latest invited tryouts at the Performance Center in Florida, and a couple of interesting names are there. One is Evolve and CZW stars Biff Busick and Drew Gaelic, who I like. I like Biff Busick. He's awesome. Drew Gaelic is good, too. But TNA knockout Jessica Havoc is getting a tryout, which would lead to me, a lot of people, to assume that she is not currently signed to TNA. Um, also, let me see here. Let me pull this up here. Ring of Honor's rating is in from last week. Or last night, I should say, they did 163,000 viewers. Not bad for your first show. The 11, M 8, 11 p.m. replay, which aired right after TNA, brung in 110,000 viewers. So, whether it's the same people sticking around to watch or whether it's new people, it's only 50,000 viewers or 53,000 viewers difference. Pretty dang good. TNA had 297,000 viewers at 9 p.m. That's down 116,000 viewers from last week. So there you go. Um, it, it It's interesting to me that, you know, they... And that's the lowest... That's the lowest audience that they've dropped to since switching cable networks, TNA. So... I, I, I look at it this way. They, they... Not bad, Ring of Honor, for your first show. On a major network like that. Not bad at all. Especially since they've only had a week to promote you. Not bad at all. Very good. Um, NXT this week featured... If you have not watched NXT from this week, you need to go watch it. The opening match to me was match of the night between Tyler Breeze and Adam Rose. Those two told a story. They have a bit of a past with those two. And it, told, it was just really good. It was really good hard-hitting. The crowd didn't seem into it, but it was a very good match nonetheless. And then you had, of course, they did a little surgery, you know, deal on uh, Sami Zayn of him going through surgery. A little bit of graphic surgery footage thrown in there that WWE likes to do. Um, he's going to be back soon. And uh, speedy recovery to Sami Zayn. I like Sami Zayn. Who? who? Um, they, then they did Finn Balor versus Rhino. Balor caught him with a roll-up for the win. And as he was going up the stage, you know, Rhino gored him from one side of the stage to the other, which looked pretty cool. Very good stuff there. Um, Tyson Kidd is injured as well, so there goes their hopes of winning the tag titles anytime soon. Bad neck injury after the muscle buster from Samoa Joe. Um, looks like he Tyler or, or uh, Tyson just took the move wrong. Well, had nothing to do with Joe's fault. Let's see here. Let's see if there's a couple more, uh, a couple more gaming news here that I could talk to you about. I I do think that uh, the Batman game coming out here in a couple weeks is going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. I'm trying to figure out a way to get a capture card so that I can let's play it. I don't think it'll happen. Another thing that I am going to let's play that should be a lot of fun is I'm probably going to do South Park Stick of Truth. I would love that game. It's probably one of the best RPGs that I've played in years. They dumbed it down enough to where it's not like that damn Final Fantasy shit that they have out today where you have to play... You have to be an RPG guy to play the modern-day ones. You have to. 
Final Fantasy X was the last one that I played where it was like, fuck yeah. And I plan on getting the remaster of that when they release it for PlayStation 4 this summer. I'm sorry, a lot of people hate Final Fantasy X, especially for the voice acting. Sorry, it was Sony's first time in 2001 doing voice acting for a Final Fantasy series, or Square's first time, not Sony's. But anyway, you get you, you, you know what I'm trying to say. It wasn't going to be perfect. For, even for those times, those standards at the time, it wasn't going to be perfect. They learned from their mistakes. I think the storyline of Final Fantasy X is probably one of the best storylines of any role-playing game I've ever played. I highly advise if nobody's ever played Final Fantasy X before, and if you could get past the, vo the cheesy voice acting, play it. Get that PS4 remake of that HD remake. It's going to be streaming in 1080p from what I heard. It's going to be very nice. It includes its sequel, which I didn't care for, Final Fantasy X-2. Um, you owe it to yourself to play that game if you're an RPG fan and if you haven't played it before. I like the turn-based deal instead of the active time battle crap. And then they had Kingdom Hearts come in and change the way role-playing was done. And now the fighting style is all open world and like Kingdom Hearts and all that. Which, I didn't care for Kingdom Hearts. Sorry, I just didn't. Um, but we're going to come right back here. And I'm going to take a bit of a break. And we're going to go ahead and air our interview that I did with Casey Carlisle. Stick with us, we'll be right back. Holy icicles! In their daily pursuit of justice, <laughs> our superhero characters do battle with the world's most evil villains. Where will the next evil villain come from? Maybe you will create them in Post Superheroes Create a Villain Contest. Grand prize. Nine kids win a one-week trip to Hollywood. They'll have breakfast with these superheroes. And the villain they've created. Second prize. One thousand win bicycles. Millions will enter and everyone who does gets superheroes puppy stickers. Details on specially marked boxes of Alphabet, Super Sugar Crisp, Honeycomb, and Pebble Cereal. You can draw and paint your villain in the picture provided. Three different pictures. Superman! Wonder Woman! Batman and Robin! Three grand prizes per picture. The most original villains win. Holy Hollywood! Post Superheroes Create a Villain Contest. Details on specially marked boxes of Alphabet, Super Sugar Crisp, Honeycomb, and Pebble Cereal. And 1640PWPR, again, Facebook.com slash 1640PWPR. We agreed not to do video for this. Because she is, I told her, I was like, you don't want to stare at my ugly mug. Not with the way I'm feeling today. But uh, she's there's a beautiful picture of you, Casey, right here on my screen right now, holding the Valkyrie Women's Championship. So everybody, please welcome on the New Surge Live line, the one, the only, Miss Casey Carlo. How are you, Casey? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Joe? I'm doing okay, except for this cat right now is trying to get me to let her out of my room that I record in. No. Hold on. <laughs> Give me one second here. Live live video, folks. Let me let the cat out. I should have thought of that before we recorded. Hold on. Yeah, I know. You want to be out. You shouldn't have came in here to begin with. Now you're nuzzling on my desk. No, she, you can't she's speak. Carl Island. She's out of here. <laughs> no. It's just she she does it when I'm working too. I'll be on the line with one of my customers and she starts meowing and somebody's like, Is there a small child in the background? I'm like, No, it's just my cat. <laughs> Are you gone now? Yeah, go over there. She's in heat too, which does not add to things. Oh that man. Help at all. Apparently the cat doesn't know how to leave radio show hosts alone. Yeah, climb up to go sleep on the couch. Anyway, Casey, thank you so much for being on. Um my thank pleasure. you for so much for freeing up your schedule. I'm going to go ahead and get the plugs out of the way first. Tell everybody if you'll be anywhere this weekend, where you'll be at, where they can find you in the next few weeks. Go ahead and let's get that out of the way here. Um, well, this coming weekend, uh, Saturday, June the 6th, I will be in Felton, Delaware for 1CW. Um, and I will be defending the 1CW women's title against Debbie Kane that evening. It's a 6 p.m. bell time at the Delaware Auto Exchange. It's right on um, DuPont Highway, which is Route 13. It goes right through Delaware. Um, so anyone in the area, obviously, I'm telling you to come out for the event. Um, it is going to be a TV taping. They mm. they do have TV up in that area, so it is a TV taping, and it's also a show to benefit the Children's Miracle Network. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, and 
the um, in addition to my title defense, there's also two matches that night that will be taking place inside of a steel cage. Mm. So um, that's all going down this coming Saturday, the 6th. And um, after that, lo and behold, I somehow ended up with some time off because my next event after that is not until the end of June. Um, June, I believe it's the 27th is the last Saturday in June. Um, and that day I will be in, it's really two towns. You could call it, uh, California, Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, or it, but it's, it's going to be over in California, Maryland for GXW. Um, and that's going to be at the VFW right there in ground, town. Ground zero? Ground zero wrestling. Yes. Okay. They're doing a Maryland show. They usually go around Richmond. I got gotcha. you. Yep, they split now. My They're friend, my They're friend Michael doing... Milton is a referee for them down there when they it's run the Richmond yes. shows. So yep. So um, this is one of their Maryland shows, and uh, my opponent has yet to be determined. So oh. I'm not sure yet who I'm going to be facing that day. Um, but that's going down the last Saturday in June in California, Maryland, and that typically is an afternoon bell time. Um, I believe it's 2 p.m. bell time for that event. So above and beyond that, I do have a ton of events coming up in the summer, July going forward. Um, unfortunately, my brain is scrambled and I haven't memorized everything yet, but I am working on updating my website. That will be updated here within a day or two and everything will be on my schedule there. Nice, nice. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, GXW, they, I know that they split a little while ago and I want to say, isn't it Sanjay Dutt that runs the Maryland side of things over them? Um, Sanjay doesn't run it. Sanjay was going up to their school and, and acting as a trainer okay. at their school. I don't know if he still is or not, but he, um, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not up on the GXW. I'm not in that circle anymore. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, that is the, um, that's, that's his involvement is only with the school. I haven't All seen right. him in any events or anything like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, well, that's very good. I mean, at least you still got ties to them because honestly, the mm -hmm. very first time I ever saw you, it was Father's Day of 2010, I believe. Hmm. And I think it was Father's Day of 2010 right around that time and it was you managing shorty smalls for a gxw show in hopewell virginia i was gonna ask so, that it was hopewell yep it was hopewell shorty took a twinkie from a little kid in the audience and acted like he was going to eat it and then threw I it remember that. right in the kid's face and hit him right between the eyes with the twinkie it was the best funniest thing i've ever seen <laughs> i do remember that twinkie yeah the twinkie incident i remember that <laughs> the twinkie incident but uh you yeah, since 2010 you have done a lot in this business. I mean, you've, you've, I, I was looking at pictures of you from <laughs> long time ago. You don't look anything like you used to. I mean, no, I you've lost a lot of weight. You look beautiful. Every time I've ever Thank seen you, you've looked beautiful. Thank you. Especially the time where you didn't get the white, you didn't get to uh, wrestle for the BWF title and they took you out of the main event. Which <laughs> me and my, then me and my friend Robert proceeded to, like I was saying on uh, that other podcast, proceeded to just pretty much, we were ticked off and we weren't having none of that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that shows you the evol evolution of a wrestling fan as well. How do, how do wrestlers now, how have you guys and ladies combated that now knowing that there are smarter fans out there and the number of smart fans is growing and growing. And mm -hmm. at any given time, we can give you a piece of our mind that we don't have just to play along. I mean, how, how have you learned to combat that? Um, to be honest with you, I haven't really come up with a way to combat it just because what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the fans, wrestling fans are so unique in to me, I think that they are so unique um, with the love-hate relationship they have for professional wrestling. They're wrestling fans, like, and they are fanatic. They truly oh, yeah. are fans. But their love of professional wrestling can go to hate so quickly and so easily. It's amazing to me that some of them even still call themselves fans because I see some of these fans, um, the smart fans, as you refer, who just rip apart every freaking thing that they see and that happens. And those are the people I want to look at and say, why are you here? Why am I wrestling in front of you right now? Because you're clearly not happy with 
any of the matches, any of the wrestlers, you're that guy. You know, you're being that guy who wants to be the fan that starts uh, the you effed up chance and this is boring and everything else. I'm like, why are you here? So I haven't really found a way to combat it, but I can tell you personally for me, um, smart fans can either be really entertaining and can really add to an event and be a really positive experience, or they can be those negative you know, taking away from the event Mm -hmm. and making it unpleasant for everyone else there to be there. It can go one way or another. And I always want to believe that the fans are respectful enough to not be jerks and to not be rude or, or, you know, disrespectful or something like that. But, you know, it happens. Unfortunately, we've all seen it happen. And it's just one of those things that, you know, has evolved with the business that is professional wrestling. As the business has changed, the fans have too. They've grown and changed and morphed right along with it. So I think it's just, it is what it is at this point. But, um, you know, I have to tell you, being in the ring, it's it's, it's really an odd feeling because at one one point you want to be like, yep, I got them. They are, you know, I don't see anyone walk into the bathroom during my match. The fans are all still here in the chairs. But if they're really just starting to be a pain in the ass, it can get really frustrating. That's when you want to just jump the barricade and, you know, yeah. just give the what for. Um, but you know what? They paid their money, and I would rather have negative, jeering fans to perform in front of instead of no fans at all because then I don't have a show to be booked on. So, exactly. you know, even even those fans, I appreciate. I appreciate every single wrestling fan because inevitably they basically keep me employed. <laughs> and, and in the case of the show that I was talking about, it's not like me and my friend Robert wanted to take over the show and show how mm-hmm. smart we are. It was a case of, okay, we know, me and my friend know better, okay? We've been watching <laughs> since we we're six years old, and I've been watching since I was six years old. I'm not in the business by any means, and I don't claim to know it all, but I do know that I know... <sighs> This is not a bet. This is not a knock on the Booker of BWF. I respect him, but in that case, it was bad booking. Come on, now we know that most ladies in this business train with men. You don't find a wrestling school out there that caters just to women. If there is one, I want to look it up and see what it's all about. You train with Shorty Smalls. You you know he taught you the business. You've probably been in the, in the ring with more men than women since you started. What's wrong with a, you know, I'm not saying you had to win the damn title, but what's wrong with you getting in there and fighting for it? You just earned it in a battle royal, and then by the end of the show, a man comes out, Mike Williams comes out, lifts you out of the ring, carries you off like, you know, like like your Princess Leia or something, and just drags you to the back. <laughs> so me and my friend were just not having any of it, so we just started to give... You know, Mike Williams threw a hip toss in the match, and we just started chanting, Casey does it better, <laughs> giving him hell. I mean, and what what killed me was, I'm going to go ahead and say his name, Bruiser is sitting over there at the audio table with his dad laughing his ass off about it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's okay, for, in my opinion, for fans to come out there and call bad booking. Call spade a spade when you see it. But then I watched NXT last night. And I watch, I don't know if you've seen it, but Eva Marie comes out for an interview about how she's going to start wrestling down there. And I don't know if it's because she got her start on Total Divas or what, but those fans were just, you could tell it got to her, which number one, you should never show fear on TV. But anyway, it's kind of hard not to when you're that inexperienced, but they tore her to shreds, you know, and it's just like, that pains me to see. And I, rem- I actually have not seen the incident you're talking about, but I can only imagine. Oh, man. She comes out there and all of, all of a sudden is you can't wrestle. And it's like you haven't seen her wrestle hardly. She's had, mm-hmm. what, two or three matches on TV? You right. Know, give, her, right. Give, give a girl a chance. Give divas a chance. Here you are. The same people who started that movement are now turning their heel, turning their backs to some to a, to a female who, who has not even had it, been given a chance to prove herself yet. Right. So... But, right. And and that's the frustrating thing, too, is, you know, you see fans getting behind movements and getting behind wrestlers, you know, individual wrestlers and such. But when it comes to, you know, like the women's wrestling movement that we're all kind of in the middle of and experiencing mm-hmm. and so forth, um, you know, you hear so many people 
saying, give women a chance and what about the girls and give them time and everything else. But then, you know, when you hear things like that and then you're at an event and during the match, you know, that's when you start hearing the, um, you know, the boring chance or the you can't wrestle. It's like you can't expect people. You can't have it both ways. You know, it's like you asked to see us out there. You want the women to have more time then I'm going to go. I'm going to go work a 20 minute match. How many people, you know, are you going to sit there and start chanting boring? halfway through my 20 minute match because you wanted us to have time and now yeah. you're chanting that you're bored. And it's a lot, and it, it especially even more so when it's a crowd like NXT who is full of smart marks, who is full of people who follow the business. There's no casual fan in that audience. So you start the whole movement, give divas a chance. And then when they try to give a diva a chance, it's like, no, nah, we don't want to see you. And mm -hmm. maybe that total divas moniker, you know, the fact that she made her headway with that television show, which I've said many of times that if you're a woman right now on the NXT roster, you're begging not to be called up because you know that's the first thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to wind up on that show and McMahon is going to sit there and he's going to mold you into what he wants, he considers a, a woman being molded as and everything you've done in NXT is just going to get thrown in the gutter. It's like that with the men too nowadays, but I, I don't, they should know better is my is my point that that crowd should know better and and it was disgusting what they did to her but hmm. i'll have to I'm, i'll have to look it up and watch it i mean i could see it if i could see it if it's in like Paducahville, kentucky where that audience is so warped at, as to what wwe the higher ups think women you know the way they treat women in wrestling so when they see women they're just like oh okay bring out the bra and panties and let's get the get mm -hmm. back to the wrestling but mm -hmm. down there in down there in Florida, there's there's no excuse for it, you know. I mean, and I think up in the Northeast, I'm going to segue into Valkyrie here. I, I'm assuming that they don't treat you that way up there either, either, because the Northeast is a hotbed for indie wrestling. Has been for almost a decade now, over a decade mm -hmm. now. They don't right. treat people down like the North and South thing. Oh man, I've noticed it's like night and day when you go up there. And oh, you think so, really? Yeah, I I. I, I I think so because you know there, you wrestle here in North Carolina, and there's still people that show up that think Ric Flair is going to come down the ring with the NWA title. Oh well, in that way, yeah, yeah, okay, I wasn't tracking with but, you. Yeah, no, well, you're right. What I mean is that you go up there, the fans are a bit smarter. They treat it a yes. little bit more seriously up there. It's not wrestling to them to, up there. It's wrestling. It's pro mm -hmm. wrestling. There is a difference, you know. Absolutely. I mean, so I'm assuming and I'm hoping that when you go up there to Valkyrie, as opposed to coming down in North Carolina, I I'm assuming it's head and tails pretty much with the way those crowds are towards you. It is, you know, that's when part of being um, successful, in my opinion, part of being a successful professional wrestler is knowing and understanding the crowd you're performing in front of, mm -hmm. you know, knowing what they want to see and, and. You know, and then that's where you find that happy medium between fans, you know, and wrestlers too. You're absolutely right. When I go wrestle in Georgia, I'm going back to Georgia in July. When I go down to Georgia, um, yes, the crowd is completely different than the crowd that I'll be wrestling in front of at Valkyrie on July 9th up in New Jersey. Completely different crowd. They have different tastes. They like different styles of wrestling. You know, down there, I mean, as you were saying, it's still... It's more of that old school mentality where they want the good versus the bad, you know, and, and they just, they want a professional wrestling match. They, they just want to sit there and they want to see they wanna, whether it's they girls want, just. They want you to hit the ropes 20 times going, yay, boo, yay, boo, before you even touch each other. And I can't well, stand that. <laughs> I can't stand it. We're getting away from that a little bit, thankfully, but, um, you know, but they, the fans, the fans down South. They do, you know, they just want to go in there. They want to see a fight. They want to mm -hmm. see people just beat the crap out of each other. They want the good guy to scream at. They want, or, you know, to cheer and the bad guy. And they just want to see a freaking fight. They like the physicality. Um, you know, when you go up north, you're correct. It is a different style. You know, I find the crowds that I wrestle in front of or have seen if I've been at a show or something, you know, they, they like the more, um, the flashier style, 
you know, they, they like more of the high spots. They like the faster paced style matches. Um, and it, it is different, you know, and I think that going back to how I started this, this comment, um, I think that's part of being a successful professional wrestler is being able to be versatile enough where no matter where you plop yourself in the country or internationally or anything else, you're able to do what you're there to do. And that's inter- entertain the crowd that paid to see you to see you perform. And I think and, that's, I think that's why ring of honor just doesn't come down to the mid Atlantic area no more. It's because they tried and the fans around here, when they go to see, you know, you put ring of honor wrestling, there are some people around this area, like in Richmond, for instance, you know, they ran a couple of shows in Richmond mm-hmm. and it was like, okay, we're going to go see wrestling. Okay. And then they get into a ring of honor show. And when they're not, cutting 30 minute promos and when they're not hitting the ropes 20 times getting fans to cheer and boo alternatively before a match and when they're going in there and just having a pure type of wrestling match the crowd didn't respond that well and i think that's the reason why ring of honor hasn't been back here you know it's the same reason why shimmer and uh, and all the other women's beds they don't you have queens of combat down in charlotte but because of queen but between queens of combat kind of partners with PWX and everybody else around that smart crowd down here who knows better. Yeah. And it, it just, it, it, you have to cater to a certain audience nowadays. It's kind of like wrestling is a, a certain types of wrestling. It's almost like you can divide it up into certain niches nowadays. Mm-hmm. But, but I think, you know, but I don't think that's a bad thing either. I mean, I think, I think that having the differences, you know, I don't want all the fans to be the same. I want Mm -hmm. them to react different things and I want them to be into different things. And, and I think that also goes with, you know, how, how wrestling fans pick their favorite wrestlers and who they follow and they support, you know, it's all based on what they want to see. And at the end of the day, that's, you know, that's what it boils down to. What do the fans want to see? And it's up to us to try to gauge that and give it to them, but do it in a way so that it we're still running the show. You know, mm-hmm. we're not being dictated to by the fans. Um, and it's such a fine line and there's so much gray area. It really, people throw around, you know, oh, it's an art and things like that. But it is. It really is. Oh, it is. It, it's finding a way to keep them happy without you know the inmates running the asylum and wrestling fans are so vocal that you're gonna know when you mess up and when they're not entertained you know Mm -hmm. you're going to hear about it um i just wish that fans could also be equally vocal about what they do like and and with some of the positive you know like putting people over in positive ways everything is so negative Mm -hmm. um you know and and us I think it's human nature to focus on negativity. It's easier to focus on negativity. And to seek it out, absolutely. But, you know, if we could just kind of take some of that energy and instead of griping about how bad this match was, why don't you spend the same amount of time putting over this other match with these two guys that maybe not many people have heard of, you Mm -hmm. know? And it's just, I'm going off on a tangent, but it's just one of those things. (laughs) I mean, it's, it, it, I think that, you know, 20 years ago, if you would have seen, you know, let's say Ric Flair and Steamboat, maybe, if they would have heard a boring chant, Steamboat's going to look at it at the crowd and go, okay, you think this is boring? Watch this. And he's going to grab Flair in a headlock and hold it for 10 minutes. And hold it forever. I've seen it happen. Yeah. And not enough of that happens nowadays, I don't think. I was taught to do that if that happened. Yeah. And to me, it's like, okay. If I'm bored with a show, and I've done it on a couple of shows, and people see it as disrespectful, but it's no different than going and watching a movie. If you're bored with a movie, okay, you paid your ten bucks, they get, they got your money. If you're not like what, liking what you're seeing, leave. <laughs> right. I've been to many a shows where I've gotten there, and I was sitting there going, and maybe it's because I'm jaded, but I'm sitting there going, this is the drizzling, you know what. <laughs> and I've gotten up and walked out. And and there's nothing wrong with that. To me, you got my money. You know, there's plenty of fans still here that'll that you can bounce off of and entertain. I just don't happen to like what you're putting out. Like, I mean, the if I find a movie that I don't like, I get up and walk out of it, you know? Now, when you've walked out of shows before, that leads me to believe that you knew what the rest of the card was and you weren't interested in anybody that was still upcoming. I have never walked out of a show... Unless it was like the main event. Okay. 
if it's so the main, not, if it's so the main event, yeah. match three. no, no, I would never, I would never do that. I at least stay till intermission. <laughs> <laughs> I at least stay till intermission. And, and that is no good. Joe White is out of here. And now that I, and now that, and who the hell am I to sit there and judge? I mean, oh, the fat guy just got up and walked out. We must be really stinking up the <laughs> joint tonight. The fat guy, oh, we still got his money, but he ain't coming back. The fat kid's not coming back next week. Come on. They don't care. <laughs> well, they should. Well, now, if that starts happening, yes, they should care because that's a really quick way to, um, you know, being in a position where you're not running any other shows. Yeah. I mean, I – and a lot of it has to do with the fact that there are some people out there who just throw a little bit of money together and think, oh, I can book. You know, I my time – many a time to myself, I've been asked a lot in the last few months – are you a wrestler or are you are you a promoter? And I'm just like, no, I'm not neither. Don't disrespect the people who are in the business by thinking that because I'm not. I just happen to have been following it for many years and I know how to call BS when I see BS. But I'm not a wrestler. I want to get that very, very, very clear to people who are listening to this, who fans who <laughs> maybe fun, maybe fans of Casey's who are watching this going, oh, God, the Mark walks out of shows. We must no. It's It's only happened a couple of times. <laughs> But anyway, I want to talk about Valkyrie. Tell me a little bit about Valkyrie. I looked on their website. They keep track of win-loss records. They do. They're one of the few. They're one of the few, if not maybe, I don't know, maybe they're the only ones. But Evolve they do. used to do that, but they don't know more. I mean, that was one of Evolve's biggest things when they first started, is that win-loss records are going to mean something. So why, what is it with Valkyrie? Why do they keep track of win-loss records? Um... I don't know that I'm necessarily privy to that answer. They, um, you know, the win-loss records, um, number one, it's just one of those cool little things, I mm -hmm. think. And number two, um, Valkyrie does use the win-loss records to um, kind of determine matches. And they and they use that, you know, to kind of play into um, title shots, you know, or, or certain uh, featured matches and things like that. I believe they do. I think that's why they keep them. I don't know if there's more to it than that. I don't know if um, I'm completely wrong and, and off base and I'm going to get a really stern email or something. No, but no, I don't want that to happen. Whoever's in charge of Valkyrie, don't email her. Don't be mean <laughs> to me. But, um, but yeah, I, I believe that Valkyrie does do that, number one, just to have another kind of way to stick out from the pack. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do believe that they, you know, they keep an eye on those and use those to, um, you know, to determine future matchups and things like that. And you're their first ever, ever champion, correct? I mean, this is I, not, this is a new group, pretty much. It just started a few months back. I am. The, uh, the next Valkyrie event is going to be on Thursday, July the 9th, um, back in Woodbury Heights, New Jersey. And that's actually their anniversary show. This is only going to be their sixth show. This mm. is only show number six. So, um, yeah, they are still, you know, especially in the world of wrestling, they're still brand new. But I cannot tell you how much I enjoy being part of that company. It is a phenomenal company to work for. Everybody involved with it, from the guys in the office, um, you know, behind the scenes, do the video, the commentary all of the graphics and, you know, the ladies in the locker room, everyone there is so awesome to work with and so professional. I have such a great time there. Um, that belt, people are seeing a picture of you right now with that belt. That is a nice looking belt that, that they have. I, I'm impressed actually, because that looks better than most WWE belts that they have right now. <laughs> My queen I, of the I, belt. Yeah, I, I would not mind a copy. I would not mind a replica of that, honestly. I mean, if, and I'm one of the, oh, the Mark buys replica belts. I don't own any, but if I was going to own any, I'd buy that one. That's beautiful. It's, yeah, and it even, um, it looks even better in person. <laughs> <laughs> You should come to a show and check it Dear, out. Dear, I live on the North Carolina-Virginia border, and I got three kids. Trying to take them to New Jersey for a wrestling show and persuade <laughs> – to The girlfriend already is, is leery about going to wrestling shows because she goes to so many of them down here. And it's like my girlfriend is a graduate of uh, – is, is, is an accountant and works for the tax department by trade. She goes to a wrestling show, and she feels so out of place. <laughs> she dresses so nice to go to these things sometimes and there the there's the redneck bill over there with the with the tank top and the cut off <laughs> jeans <laughs> she feels so out of place she looks around i took her the very first wrestling show i ever took her to was a pwx show mm -hmm. actually no 
Is it BWF or PWX? Actually, no. The very first show I took her to was that damn thing in Salem that I met you at where you took that photo with my son. Oh, where, the, yeah. Where it drew like 20 people. Yeah. Which was not your fault. No way was that your fault. Bad promoting. Thanks. But, oh, that was, it, I think it was so poorly promoted. There was, yeah, it was at the sale, the Civic Center. They had a building that needed a show instead of a show that needed a building. <laughs> it was at the Salem Civic Center, drew 20 people. And my girlfriend's sitting there looking around at these people going, oh my God, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was, I mean, now, now like you take her, I took her to PWX, which has kind of like been dubbed the ROH of the South. And mm -hmm. you take her to PWX though. And when Caleb Connolly and Cedric Alexander are in the crowd throwing chairs at each other, oh boy, she then kind of was like getting into it a little bit more because the crowd there was a little bit smarter and yeah, you know, she, she got into it more there, but a more interactive going all the way to New Jersey for a show while I would love to sadly eight hour drive up there is not going to happen. <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> well, it sounds like we need to talk to Valkyrie about bringing the Valkyrie down South. I would love it personally. <laughs> would, it, would it get over down here? I mean, Northern Virginia, you, you're from up North, so it might as well be DC, <laughs> which might as well, <laughs> which might as well be Maryland. So, right. Once you drop below Dumfries, I would say, it's it's night and day to me, you know? It's just how I, I grew up with it being night and day, you know? You go to King's Dominion, and it's like night and day from Richmond. <laughs> so, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about being a rosebud. You got to be a rosebud for WWE and for Adam Rose, and you got to eat, I'm sure, what was a cold as ice by the time you bit into it sonic hot dog <laughs> no i didn't have any hot dogs oh you didn't all. have a hot dog okay it must no, have been thankfully what? not oh okay it must have been another girl that was there with you because i remember caleb Connolly was in that bit with you um mm -hmm. and they had you i was pissed off because they had you in the back to where they could barely see you but i saw you and... i was right off just like right before the the edge of the shot on the left yeah and and Everybody, everybody's like, oh, Caleb Connolly, Caleb Connolly. I was like, screw that. My girl's on the screen. <laughs> Casey Carlisle. I was like, holy shit, it's Casey Carlisle. She's on. I was marking out. I was marking out like a little five-year-old boy. But talk to, you were. talk to us about that experience. How did you get contacted to do that? Who contacted you? Like, take us through that whole day of finding out and going to the building and everything. Um, well, the one, I, I was a rosebud on two different occasions. Um, the one that you're referring to took place last July mm -hmm. and that was in, <coughs> excuse me, that came out it's of nowhere. Okay. Um, that was, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, Richmond and then the next day was Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. Um, but the way I got, got contacted, I actually, for that go around, I got contacted, um, by one of my fellow female indie workers by the name of Brittany Force. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she said, hey, they need someone. And I said, hey, I'm, I can be that someone. So um, that was my first time ever doing any type of work with really? the WWE. And it was, to say that it was a day of mixed emotions would probably be an understatement. Um, I was excited. I was happy, I was nervous, I was curious, um, I was nervous again, um, you know, it was just, I was anxious to just get there already and get the day underway, you know, it was like the whole anticipation of, of what's going to happen and what mm -hmm. am I going to do, how's it going to go, and, um, did you get to meet, it, did you get to meet Vince? I met Vince very very briefly it was a nod and a hello as he was walking past is he is he an, as intimidating as everybody says he is he's vince mcmahon uh, that, that's, he's a promoter of course. I, mean, <laughs> I don't i don't i mean maybe it's because i've never met the man myself but when everybody says they get intimidated by vince and i'm just like the man puts his pants on the same way i do except for his cost more than mine yeah to be honest with you i did not have long enough of um in an interaction with him to even have a chance to be intimidated because it was literally he was walking towards the gorilla position 
Um, and it was literally, you know, an acknowledgement. It wasn't even an official, hello, hi, my name is. It was simply an acknowledgement as the man walked by. It was like the old tip of the hat and keep going. Exactly. It was like, you know, nodded, I smiled, and I, you know, hello, sir. And, and he did, you know, hello, and that was it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even have time to be intimidated by the man. Um, I can imagine if I were sat down in a room with him to speak to him, even though he is a human being like you and I, and he puts his pants on one leg at a time, I'm, I'm sure I would be intimidated by him because, you know. He started it all. He, right. It, you know, because it's Vince McMahon and because my journey that I'm on right now started when I was a little eight-year-old girl. And Vince McMahon, to me, was one of the commentators on Superstars, um, you know, and then as obviously time has worn on and so forth. But when you become aware of his influence and, and you know, what he's done and his mind and everything, mm -hmm. I think everybody would be intimidated by him in some way just because, you know, I, I think it's just the pressure of wanting to make a good impression. I think it's the pressure of wanting to sound like you know what the hell you're talking about. I think it's just the pressure of, you know, the most, like, strenuous job interview you could ever have. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, it's, the, whole, it's the whole walking on eggshells thing that everybody right. talks just, about. Right. And I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm guessing. I don't have any experience. I don't know if it's... Are people intimidated by the man himself or are they intimidated by the reputation and the uh, the legacy and just who he is, the you know, the persona? So I'm not sure. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I can honestly say if I had to sit down and speak to him or if I ever had that chance, I'd be nervous about it just because, you know, mm -hmm. if you hold somebody in a high, high esteem, I think you're always going to have that surge of emotion when it comes right. to that. It's like meeting your hero, you know? Yeah. Kind yeah. Of. In many ways. But anyway, you, you, you get, you get the call, you get, you get to the Coliseum. Who's the first agent, whatever, who, who do you see first there from WWE and what do they say to you? Um, the first person I, I saw was, um, who was the first person I saw? Now I have to rewind almost a year in my brain. Now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Gosh, Joe, these high pressure questions. Um, I think that John Cone, I think it, it John Cone was the first guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm positive it is. John Cone, who's one of the referees, but mm -hmm. also, um, you know, works with the talent right. uh, behind the scenes. He was the first one and, and ended up, and still to this day, is my point of contact um, with them. You know, could not have been nicer, could not obviously have been more pleasant. Um, but met up with John backstage, got checked in. Um, you know, we were in Virginia, so we had to make sure the license is all squared away and all that was good. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. Even yep. though they're, even though they're classified as entertainment, the commission still wants their, their part of the gate and everything. So I had to make sure I had it with me. You know, I, uh, it, you just have to make sure yeah, you have it with you. Um, but it was, you know, people started showing up and arriving, my fellow rosebuds. And, um, it was just a really cool atmosphere. It was, um, I was there for a Monday night raw. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was very, very busy backstage. You can imagine how much was going on with oh, yeah. the production crews and the setup and everything else. Um, but I did not have any negative experiences with anybody, with anybody there. It was, you know, everyone was very pleasant. Everyone was very nice. Um, you know, obviously some of the guys, and when I say guys, I mean, you know, the wrestlers, some of them, you know, were a little bit more outgoing than others, but I don't expect people to see right. indie wrestlers come walking in, but like, guys, come on over, sit here, hang out with us. That kind of um, always has mystified me because they were there too at that one, at one point. They were. And, and I'm not saying like there certainly was not. Oh, look my, at, look at the indie wrestlers. There was none that, of that, you know, obviously. In my but. experience when I was there, I didn't feel any of that. If there was, I didn't notice it or pick up on it. Um, you know, it was just, everybody was very kind. Everybody was very welcoming. Um, you know, could not have been nicer. Uh, you know, we were right there in catering and being right up in everyone's stuff, but it, it was fine. Um, and the whole experience was incredibly fun. It was incredibly rewarding in the sense of just being there and being able to 
even if, you know, even, in, okay, so my role was a rosebud, you know, and we're an extra, but you're still there. And it's like, here is the place where everybody wants to end up at some point. Everybody wants to be here. And even though I'm an extra, it's like, okay, now I'm getting just this tiny, tiny, tiny little taste of being here. And I was soaking in as much of it as I could from the lighting setup to the production setup, you know, to the sets, to filming the the vignettes and the promos, everything. I'm just trying to soak in as much of it as I could. Um, and it was such a great experience. I was so thankful and so happy and lucky to be able to do that. Did, um, did they, is it true that they make extras dress away from the other talent? Did you get the, you know, mingle with the divas at all in, in their locker room or do they keep you guys away from everybody else? No, we else? were separate. We, yeah, no, yeah. there was a dedicated Rosebud locker room. Wow. That's crazy. How many takes did it take to, uh, cause see, cause I'm a, I'm a movie buff. So I'm more enamored <laughs> about the production side of things with WWE. I love the production. I, mm-hmm. the fact that they could sit there and take that, there was a video not long ago about what it takes to set up. It was right around WrestleMania. The fact that they take mm-hmm. that stage and they assemble one half of it on the one side of the arena and then push it under the Titan Tron baffled right. me. But right. how many takes did it take you guys to do? Who directed your segment? Go into that a little bit if you can. For the Sonic? Mm-hmm. For the one for the Raw, for Monday Night Raw. The well, that go around, um, the one in July, the only my only involvement in the Rosebud only Rosebud's only involvement was doing that um spot for Sonic. Mm-hmm. I didn't have anything um, you know, as far as a match or anything that day. But the Sonic spot, um I honestly can't tell you who directed it. I'm not sure. But it took about I wanna say five. Really? Four, maybe four and if they it do it a couple if they do it anything like hollywood does man the the resets for those things take forever because you got to bring in fresh hot dogs nothing can look the same as it did in the nice steak because if somebody bites off of a hot dog no <laughs> it can't look like that you got to bring in a fresh you hot dog and, the hot dog yet yeah um, um yeah it took it took the setup between wasn't actually wasn't too bad really? um it was more of a like you know lighting issues or volume issues or um camera angles things like that was really more of the reason why there had to be retakes mm-hmm. um but it, it took a couple of times and you know we were tweaking it a little bit as far as um you know w- what angle is is damien going to come in and you know on the skates like is he coming from here is he coming from here and so they were tweaking it a little bit um but again that was one of those times when i was standing there just watching all of this play out and just soaking in as much of it as i could and you- I'm, you come from the old school of, I'm, I'm assuming because this is where I come from, I was always told that when you're entering into something like that, you shut your mouth, you soak it up like a sponge, you don't mm-hmm. really ask any more questions than what you need to, nope. and you learn. Silent. Mm-hmm. I I did, I hardly uttered words at all that whole weekend. I can see, I can see Adam walks in it's and Casey's just like, I can see Adam walks in and Casey's just like, Hi. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> Hi there. Um, no, I mean, you know, it's it's one of those situations where you better be a pro when you're there. Yeah. There's no room for unprofessionalism. There's no room for, um, you know, ego. There's no room for, you know, any type of unprofessional conduct. And, and if there was any, you know... It just makes me shake my head. Um, Because one one wrong move and that's it. You're done. You're never coming back. Well, and what bothers me is, you know, it's like, look, it's already, we're we're all walking around backstage with the big, you know, neon arrow pointing down to our head that says Indie Worker. Mm -hmm. So to me, if any of the um, indie men and women who have, you know, done any of the extra work with them or anybody, if you start acting unprofessionally, then really what you're doing is not only making an ass out of yourself, but you're making, you know, you could make the rest of us look like jerks too. Yeah. You know, who are these indie people, this crop of indie stars they keep bringing in who, you know, are thinking that they are, you know, here and and that they've made it and that you can do that type of thing or you can say that type of thing it's just i was that person as much as i could be who was standing out of the way you know quiet and just 
just watching, you know, I'm not gonna, it's like, I'm not going to wander through these halls and go in this room unless I know that I'm allowed to, or <laughs> I've been asked to, I'm not, you know, it was one of those things when I got to catering, my ass is hanging back waiting for all of those contracted people to go through that line. You don't just jump in the catering line. No, I was going to ask you what catering is like, because I'm a, I'm a big dude. I like to eat. And that's another thing that has enamored me is that that catering crew follows them or the people who actually make the food. They follow them from show to show, even yeah. on house shows. I've heard that there's, there's sometimes catering. What, it, what is there to eat at catering? I mean, the what catering is catering was like? Phenomenal. The food was phenomenal. <laughs> like that was, uh, especially the second, the second time, um, I was a rosebud, which was in September. That was like all that we could talk about the next day was how good the catering was and our, our excitement to get into catering. Um, <laughs> they had I'm here a, for the food <laughs> we're, we're here for the food guys we're just here for the food um they had such a spread oh my god I mean really they almost had anything you could imagine which obviously isn't true it's an exaggeration but you know they had chicken they had um well there's got to be that grilled chicken breast my man's pissed <laughs> oh it, but it was phenomenal I loved the chicken uh there was chicken there was you know pot roast there's salads of course there's soups there's um, sandwiches, there's fish, there's, I mean, it, there's just such a wide variety. Um, because obviously when you have a crew that large and that diverse, oh, man. you're going to need variety. So, um, yeah, it, it was phenomenal, but, um, and they had coffee. So I was a happy camper <laughs> because I, I could get literally limitless coffee. I think I went back to that coffee machine I can't even tell you how many times. They have a coffee <laughs> machine? They don't brew it fresh there or do they just put it out in urns or? No, no. I mean, it was brewed. Yeah, they brewed it there, but I just, I visited it a lot while I was there. <laughs> Not, hey, it, it's, it's free. All right, well, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a coffee fanatic, so I <laughs> almost always have coffee in my hand. I can just imagine some cheap ass indie worker who gets to catering and has lined their bags with plastic Ziploc baggy stuff in the crap in there. Like, we don't eat like this on the road. <laughs> it doesn't say all you can eat here. Hey, anybody Golden Gold Corral after the show, hit me up. I'll do the same oh, thing there. <laughs> that's hilarious. But, but yeah, um, but to get back to kind of being there, you know, it was one of those situations where um, I always hope that that indie workers don't walk in there and think of themselves as employees, as I work here, you know, or You're I'm a temp. part of the company. You're a we're temp. Not. Exactly. We're, it's like, hey, guys, I just can I remind you that we are done in a day and we're going back home while they keep going up the road, running the loop and working. It's like, we, we don't work here. We're not part of this. This is where we want to be. And we're lucky as hell to be standing here as it is. Um, so yeah, really when it comes down to it, it's like professionalism and just soak in as much as you possibly can, because who knows, I don't know if I'll ever be there again. So I was soaking in everything, you know, everything I possibly could. Uh, so when it's over and when they shoot the segment, is it okay, bye, get the heck out of our backstage area? Or is it feel free to um, stay here and enjoy the show? Or No, it was, it was um, you know, Go. stick around. You don't leave. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed for the entire, every time I was there, I stayed for the entire event. Um, just because it's just what you do. And it's res being respectful. It's respectful, right. It's respectful, especially in that type of environment. When I'm and when I'm at indie shows, I stay until the event is over because it's just the right thing to do. It's the respectful thing, unless you have a reason why you need. Obviously, that happens. But um, no, when we were done, you know, they they weren't 100 percent sure yet if they were going to need us again or not. So it was just one of those things of, um, you know, OK, we're done shooting this. You know, you're you're free to you're free for right now, but hang close, you know, kind of stay near catering or, or kind of meet back up in this area at this time because they were still determining um, if they had any other roles for us that evening. And that, so. that kind of that kind of speaks to the way that the shows are written nowadays and that it's very much WCW Nitro-esque and that they're writing the show on napkins prior to the event. So, <laughs> I mean, and, and I any, know you know, well, I mean, it was rumored that Bischoff was writing the show on a napkin three hours before production shot mm -hmm. time, but back in the day. But right. what I mean is that, you know, they, they, 
and and anybody's given mind they have this stuff planned out a week in advance and that just simply is not the case anymore you know you, well, 30... so much can happen i mean you know there's so much that could happen the day of if if somebody's flight is delayed you know mm -hmm. and they're not going to be there or what if the the live tv feed goes out or something there's so much that could happen or um you know if if time constraints beforehand or something i'm i'm sure that it's just and i think that has to do with the evolution of wrestling as well as you know we have now this live tv mm -hmm. all the time you, you know you want to pack in as much as you can right. and i think that you've that everyone has just become accustomed to rolling with the punches and literally just having to work on the fly often and frequently i i think too is that you know but they should have a general idea of what they want before they go in there. You know, you have a whole week in between tapings pretty much. But I see what you're saying in the fact that, you know, what if Adam Rose fell and broke, slipped on some coffee backstage and right. broke his leg before your segment's taped? It's like, okay, well, now what do we do with Casey and the rest of the bunch? Right. It's do we send them home? Do we put them in another segment? Do, you know. Right. It, it's, it, I could see your point to that, but the fact that they're still rewriting the show as the show's going on. Well, Especially for main event guys, it. but no, I'm I'm not saying that they were rewriting it. I I can't say that they were doing that. They just for us specifically. Well, for you guys specifically, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. sure that they already had a general idea. But when you hear about them, when you when you go online, of course, oh lord, here we go. The marks oh, reading the dirt I'm sheets. The marks reading the dirt sheets. Uh, sorry, but the Observer was passed around in locker rooms back in the day, boys and girls. <laughs> Most people still subscribe to it only under fake names. So get over yourselves. But I mean, when I have you a copy read of an old Observer newsletter somewhere, <laughs> when you read about when you read about people sitting there going, "Oh yeah, well the main event was rewritten three times while the filming of the show was taking place." To me, mm -hmm. there's there's no excuse for that. And it all boils down to it's not the writer's fault. It's Vince. It's Vince. Vince has final say in everything, which brings me to my my another question I had. You brought up earlier that every that's where everybody wants to be, right? And, and and I get why you would want to be there right now because a it's a paycheck. B you're on the biggest stage in the world as far as pro wrestling goes. Mm -hmm. C it's your childhood freaking dream to be there. Okay, mm -hmm. but are you? How do I put this without sounding like an asshole? As a woman's wrestler, are you scared to go there if they called you right now? Am I scared to go there? Meaning that, I mean, like we pointed out earlier, it's it's the place where everybody wants to be, but the way, I mean, they, obviously Part being pigeonholed into having to be on Total Divas and yeah, I mean, would you want to do matches you, or I mean, whatever? Granted, it's getting your name out there, but I'm assuming that that's not the women who are on that show kind of envision themselves like that because they were mostly models first you are a women's wrestler first that's what you trained for that's what you wanted to be mm -hmm. granted you got the beautiful face and body to go along with it thank you but how do you how would you respond to that if they all of a sudden called you up tomorrow and said casey we want to offer you a spot on nxt would you i mean granted nxt right now is the place to be you know but i if, absolutely would do it if they called me tomorrow and they and they offered i absolutely would I think I would be if I, I would end up holding that as one of the very few regrets in my life if I didn't. I think for me personally, and the reason I say that is because I would be intentionally, knowingly, and I would I would be choosing to walk away from um, achieving the dream that I have had since I was eight simply because I was making assumptions for what the future held for me or for how I would be used or what they would do. Mm -hmm. Because I would be trying to predict what, you know, could happen. Yeah, and I'm not saying that's what that would that's what would happen to you, but that kind of becomes that's kind of the norm nowadays. I mean, look at what they've done to Paige. Paige is kind of cut, you know, her family was in the business. She was a woman's wrestler first and foremost, and now she's on Total Divas and in, is lucky if she gets eight minutes a week on Raw. You know, it's... it's. Yeah, but... Yeah, and I totally get that. And I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I wish that there was so much more emphasis on in-ring for the women. I really do. Um, but I cannot honestly say that I would 
turn down that opportunity just because there's not as much in ring as I would like. Um, I mean, you'd be a fool to turn it down just because of the exposure it, and the money. <laughs> I mean, well, let's be I mean, real. It's a business. Nice, first, yeah. It's a business first and foremost. Yeah, know? those would be nice, of course. But I, I can tell you for me personally, I would end up regretting it if, you know, I had this chance and I turned it down because I wasn't, you know, well, I'm not going to get eight minute matches. I'm only going to get four. So I'm not going to go that route. Um, you know, just because, like I said, for me personally, I grew up watching the WWF. That's what I grew up on. That was my love. Um, you didn't grow up watching Crockett? I No, I didn't get Crockett. Neither did I. I, 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 I grew up in Richmond, and it's like they came to town, but their TV wasn't up here. Mm -hmm. I got... Um, I watched New York, <laughs> you know? I, I had New York. I had... Um, Every now and then, depending on if it was cloudy or not, I could get global out of Texas. <laughs> you had to go outside and turn the antenna. I had to. I had to adjust the rabbit ears. Mm -hmm. It was on. I think it was on a UHF channel. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. UWF was. I got UWF one night. <laughs> you remember the old UWF? Oh yeah. I got UWF one night, um, and I would get like LPWA and uh, and Glow. Glow but, was, oh man, Glow was never awesome. Got never got Crockett. But yeah, I mean, you know, I would hope, I don't know, because on one hand, I completely agree with you. It's like, I want to wrestle. I want to be in that ring. That's what I love to do. That's where I feel right and well, at home. Bottom line is you wouldn't consider you wouldn't consider it. And I know that's how the question came off. And I apologize if it did come this off this way. You wouldn't be selling your soul to the devil. I mean, it's 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 not like you're sitting there going, you know, oh Lord, this is how they're going to use me because the way the women's wrestling movement is going and the way Triple H has this vision for women's wrestling. Who knows? You could get the call tomorrow and all of a sudden, you know, they could sit there and change the way they book the women. They could give the women yeah. 20 minutes. You never know. Exactly. This business is so fluid and it's so dynamic and it's always changing in so many ways. And it can. We've seen it over the years. We've seen it happen where, you know, the 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 course of the business could change overnight or in mm -hmm. just a matter of weeks or something. So I I would think for me personally, again. I wouldn't turn down the opportunity because I'd be turning down the opportunity based on my my guesses and my assumptions, and I would end up regretting it. You know, I would want to at least take that opportunity and seize it because number one, it was presented to me, and I know how hard I've worked. Yeah. You know, all these years. I just um, know that from a Mark's point of view, can and that's pretty much how this show has always been. Is I'm a I'm a fan first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I may be a little bit smartened up. But I don't know my ass from a hole in the ground to really the way the way you're supposed to work. But anyway, that's besides the point. From a Mark's point of view, if I'm a worker, I want to stay in NXT. If I'm a Finn Balor right now, I'm praying that they don't call me up. Yeah. And that has to. And it's not their fault. I want to. And it's not the fans' fault. It's at the end of the day, as much as he may be loved, it's on one man's shoulders. And when you watch it, what he's done to all these guys who have come out of this incarnation of NXT, man or woman, you know, look at the way Adam Rose has been booked, the Ascension have been booked, Paige has been booked, you know, at, you could go down the list and it's just like they're not, it's, it's almost like down there in Florida, you're good, but wait till I get you up here and teach you a lesson or two. And it's, to me, it's, it's... Mm. I could be wrong. That's just how I see it. And I'm sure That's a lot of people opinion. out there are going to, I'm sure a lot of people out there in the comments below in this podcast are going to sit there and go, Joe, you're wrong. How dare you speak to an indie <laughs> worker like that? You should be more respectful. But I, it's from my point of view. It's from a, from a Mark's point of view. We all have our opinions and we're all entitled to them. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I'd watch Total Divas if you were on it, but that's just me being a Casey Carlisle <laughs> Mark. <laughs> but you. anyway, Anyway, Casey, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and on, on that note and say goodbye to you here. Don't hang up with me yet because after I push recording, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more here. But uh, thank okay. you so much for doing this. Thank you. Um, again, tell everybody where you're going to be here. Tell them how they could get in touch with you on Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, who, if anybody ever uses that anymore. MySpace. MySpace. <laughs> you know, I logged into my MySpace account recently for the first time in about five years. 
Um, Nothing's there it, anymore, is it? It's not there. No, yeah, it's mine's not. Mine's not there. Like, no, it, I tried to do that a couple of weeks back. I was like, hmm, MySpace. You know nope. what? I wanted, I wanted to go on there to um, get pictures, get old pictures mm -hmm. off of there. Um, my this coming July is going to be 10 years that I've been wrestling. It's going to wow. mark my 10 year anniversary in the ring. And so I'm trying to gather some old pictures because I want to put myself over on that day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to shine the spotlight on myself and As pat well myself on the back and put myself over. And I'm going not to many so. make it, not many make it that, that far. Yeah. So everyone's being warned on July 30th, I'm going to be selfish for a day, <laughs> make it all about me. But, um, but yeah, it's completely weird. So, but getting back to this, um, as far as social media that does work and that is accessible goes, um, I am on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash Casey Carlisle. Um, my profile page has been full as far as my friends list goes for quite a while. So I'm getting, I have a lot of people tell me they try to send me a friend request and they can't. Um, I do allow followers, however. So if anybody wants to follow me, you'll see that button on my page. Um, all my posts are public anyway, so everyone can, you know, if you follow me, you'll see everything. I also have a Facebook fan page, which is facebook.com slash Casey Carlisle fan page. So you want to head over there and click the like button on that. Um, I do have my website, which is CaseyCarlisle.com. Um, I'm working on updating it right now, and it should be completely updated within a day or two. Um, but that's where you can find my upcoming schedule, um, you know, photo galleries, links to YouTube videos of my matches, my Twitter feed, a little bio about myself, merchandise. I have um, f autographed photos for sale on there. I have some old, Joe, you might remember the fur boot covers I used to wear in the ring. Yeah. I have those for sale. Um, I think I have a couple of DVDs left, maybe. Somebody, but somebody on Facebook was asking about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, that was a little bit of a debacle, I, but... I did get one fan question here before we go, and okay. I forgot to ask it. It's a guy by the name of Stephen Fry. He says to tell you, he says hello, and uh, he goes, "What are some of the girl? What are some of the girls in the Carolina region would you like to face? Who who in the Carolina region right now? The only girl that I mean, Tessa Blanchard's tearing it up down here. Um, yeah, and I just actually I just wrestled Tessa a couple of months ago down at PWX. Mm -hmm. Mm, I, w I would be more than happy to be in the ring with Tessa again. Um, I Steven knows better than to put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think, because to be honest with you, I don't make it down to Carolina as often as I used to. And I think a lot of the girls that I used to work with down there maybe aren't around anymore. Um, one girl I know who is, who I always speak highly of because I think she's, um, a good talent is Alexis Parrish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen her, Joe. I haven't seen her, but I've heard of her. Yeah, she's she's young. She's in year, I think, four, three or four maybe. Um, but I've wrestled her several times, and, and she's a, a good young talent who I'd like to actually see working a little bit more than she is. So um, Stephen Fry, the answer is Tessa, Alexis Parrish. I'm trying to think of anyone else down there. Um, you know, I just did the the um, Masters of Ring Entertainment, the Women's Wrestling Legacy Show. I was going to ask that, you about that. I never even heard of it until you posted on your Facebook. That was in Carolina, wasn't it? It was in Wilmington, North yeah. Carolina. Mm -hmm. It was a tremendous event. I know that we're wrapping up right now. Maybe we can talk about it next time I come on if you want to have me back on one time. Uh, uh, I got a couple extra minutes if you do. Go ahead and talk about it if you want. It was – that event was tremendous. and. Um, I can honestly say I was truly honored to be there and to be part of it. That day was incredible. It was fun. You know, um, what it was, for those who aren't familiar, Masters of Ring Entertainment um, hosted a tribute to women's wrestling, the lasting legacy of women's wrestling down in Wilmington. Um, it was a day-long event. It started with the uh, meet and greet in the afternoon, and then we had a one-day tournament for some of, um, some of us independent ladies that day um in the afternoon and then that right after the tournament was a q a session with the women and then that night was a um a banquet to honor the ladies that were there um the women who were there were uh headlined by trish stratus hmm. um lita um hello casey mine went blank trish stratus lita terry reynolds um little egypt from glow was there oh, okay 
Missy Hyatt was there. <laughs> um, Ivory was there. And uh, Victoria was there. Lisa really? Marie. Well, yep, she was there. And it was just a tremendous night to be there and to be part of it. All of the women were so wonderful. They were so gracious. Um, and it was just really cool to be there and to hear their points of view on women's wrestling. Um, you know, and just to be able to have that interaction with the fans that were there. And it was really just celebrating women's wrestling in general and as a whole and how far it's come and all of the, you know, the history behind it that maybe some people aren't so familiar with, you know, when women would be wrestling bears and, um, you know, or, or we're kind of grouped down on the card with, you know, it's the, the women and the midgets are like, you know, yeah. the, the sideshow attraction. So it was really just a, a great event. It was a lot of fun. Are they going to do it next year? Or is that just like a one-time thing or? I don't know. Um, I don't know if they're going to try to make it an annual thing or not, but I hope that they try to do something like it again, because it, it really was an awesome event. And if they do do something like it again, I'd love to be part of it. And I would hope that um, maybe we can help spread the word a little bit more and get even more people packed in there. It was yeah, a really if, great time. If it happens again, let me know, because that's something I would definitely travel down there for. I'm not, I, will. I don't get to go to Charlotte Fan Fest and I want, I want to go to Charlotte Fan Fest every now and then, but that sounds like it's something a little bit, a little bit more close knit and a little bit less crowded. If yeah. You will. And yeah. I, I like things that are less crowded because I don't like crowds, which explains yeah. why I'm not in the business, folks. <laughs> anyway, Casey, thank you so much for doing this. Also, you have a Twitter. You didn't mention your Twitter. It's at Casey oh, Carlisle. On, right? At Casey Carlisle. I'm on Twitter. I'm on YouTube, Casey Carlisle. Um, every, I'm, I'm usually pretty easy to find. If you Google my name, I'm usually pretty easy to find. But my website, Facebook, and Twitter, um, you know, my YouTube are, are definitely all right there. And speaking of that women's event that happened, recently in Wilmington, if you want to see what Casey looks like all nice and in a dress. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. All, you look, dolled, up. all dolled up. Which you you're all, you're all, I don't have the picture up here. I'll let them go to your Facebook and follow you for it, but you're there always you dolled up. I've never seen you not dolled up. Even after the end of an ass kicking, you still look dolled up. <laughs> well, thank you. You come to the ring with the blush on your cheeks and the hair back, and by the end of the match, the hair's down and everywhere, and you look beautiful. But anyway... <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, folks. Thank you, Jeff. We're going to be right back with more. You're listening and watching New Search Live right here on NewSearchLive.com, 1640 PWR, 1640 PWPR, Facebook.com slash 1640 PWPR. I feel like Howard Stern. I can't say the call letters properly. <laughs> We're still new, folks. We're still growing. Casey, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. And that about does it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Yes, the hair has changed. The shirt may still be the same. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it's the next morning. I just woke up. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're listening to the audio version, head on over to YouTube. Check out my other videos. I have videos. I have a Let's Play of Batman Arkham Asylum going right now. YouTube.com slash Tons of Fun WWE. Um, also, NewSearchLive.com. There's links to everything about this show. Everything about me is there. Um, check it out. We post stuff there regularly now. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. 1640PWPR. Facebook.com slash 1640PWPR. Check us out there. There are other great podcasters on there. Ken Reedy's on there, King Firehawk's on there. Be sure to check them out as well. There's other new up-and-comers there. Um, if you're interested in becoming a, a cast member, if you will, or a disc jockey for us, uh, DJ, podcaster, I think now is the term. What do I know? I'm 30. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested in doing that, I'm sure there's somewhere on the 1640 PWPR page you can get in contact with King Firehawk. He runs the show. He'll be happy to talk to you, I'm sure, if he has the time and explain everything. Serious inquiries only, please, because uh, we're not looking for just some eight-year-old wanting to do a podcast. We're looking for something serious. We're looking for something pro wrestling. We're looking for something something entertaining, I guess. Anyway, guys, that does it for me here today. I want to thank you, Casey Carlisle, so much for being our guest here on New Surge Live this week. And uh, we'll see you guys down the road. Thank you.